In this uh, video, I want to explain you some joint work with Rob Lewis on formalizing the ring of width vectors. So there are many different ways to uh, motivate the ring of width vectors, and they have several applications in number theory. But I think one of the most appealing uh, motivations in this setting is um, coming from addition with carry. So let's get started. Um, we have some uh, some prime number p, and we consider the field f p. So this is the field z modulo p z of numbers of, of integers modulo the prime p. So this is a finite field with p elements. And as you all know, when you do modular arithmetic, then you loop back to zero when you get back when you get beyond the number p. So now, can we use some sort of addition with carry to construct a ring of characteristic zero? So a ring where the where the integers set inject uh, into this new ring. And if we can do this with FP, maybe can we also do it with other rings of characteristic P? And this turns out to be a really the answer is yes. The answer is yes, you can do this with the width vectors. And this turns out to be a very useful and fundamental construction in number theory. So I won't really go into the applications, but I want to explain a bit of the details behind the construction and um, then also look at some, some things that we did in the formalization, some useful techniques uh, that made the end result more pleasant than I expected when I started on this. So as the motivating example, we'll just look at the case of two digits. So we have two digits uh, with values in FP, X0 and X1. And we want to, to add the digits in the zeroth place and in the ones place, but we want to sort of keep a, keep a carry from the from the zeroth coefficient. So the addition should look something like uh, if you add x1, x0 to y1, y0, um, then in the zeroth position you just add the two digits, and in the first position you add the two digits, but you also get some sort of carry that depends on, on x0 and uh, y0. Now, what exactly should this carry be? And um, because uh, we would also want to apply this to, uh, to other rings than FP, we cannot really use specific knowledge about FP. So we're not really allowed to take representatives um, in, in the final result. We can, do that, we can do it in this case study, but we want to come up with an end result that only um, only uses the addition and multiplication in FP and the universal elements 0 and 1 that always exist, but uh, so not any specific elements. And such an answer would then also work for more general rings of characteristic P. So this is sort of the constraints under which we are working. Now, there are some fundamental observations that we can make about, about our setup. And here we will be, in the proofs, use, uh, use specific information about our ring. But as we'll see in the end result, this specific information is, is no longer there. And so we can apply it to other rings as well. So the first observation is, if we have some element x in z modulo pz, if you multiply it by p while you stay in this ring z modulo pz or fp, then of course you get zero because p is zero in this ring. But if, if you sort of go one level up to z modulo p squared when you multiply by p, then there is actually a unique element that plays the role of p times x. And the way you see this is if you take the, the morphism, so the, the group homomorphism of, that is multiplication by p, on the ring of integers, then you can uh, 
you can then look at the quotient map to z modulo p squared and you'll notice that uh, all the multiples of p are in the kernel because if you have a multiple uh, of p and you multiply it by p then it's divisible by p squared so it goes to zero so this this composite map um, so first the top and then then the right map factors via z modulo pz and uh, so this is the map that is sort of multiplication by p on z modulo pz and it lands in z modulo p squared z and um, so analogously the proof is a bit different but but the statement looks similar um, for every element x in z modulo pz we can also find an element x to the power p in z modulo p squared z and it's again unique in the sense that um, any two candidates uh, x modulo p uh, sorry x to the power p and y to the power p that are uh, congruent modulo p will actually be the same element so let's let's prove what exactly uh, is going on and um, so the precise claim is that if we have two integers a and b such that they're congruent modulo p then in fact the if you take the pth powers a to the power p and b to the power p then those will be congruent modulo p squared and how do we prove this well um, the fact that a and b are congruent modulo p means that b is of the form a plus n times p for some n and so now we just compute a plus n times p to the power p we use the uh, binomium of newton to get um, so what what do we get we get a uh, binomial coefficient p over i and we get a to the power i and a factor n times p to the power p minus i. So now um, what we do is we split off the first and the last term of this sum and then the binomial coefficients will be one so those you don't see those anymore. So we get a term a to the power p that would be the last term actually and the first term uh, where i is zero um, we get n times p to the power p and then the remaining terms are in this sum um, where the summons are just the same as what we had above but now the observation is because p is a prime number these binomial coefficients where i is between 1 and p minus 1 will all be divisible by p so uh, this is divisible by p And this other term, n times p to the power p, well, primes are at least two, so this will be divisible by p squared, actually. And finally, in these summons, because, because i is between one and p minus one, we always also pick up a factor p from this, this factor n times p. So this is also divisible by p. And in total, that means that every all the, all the terms that come after the a to the power p are divisible by p squared. So this shows that this uh, a plus np to the power p, which is just b to the power p, is actually congruent to a to the p modulo p squared. So a to the p is congruent to b to the p modulo p squared. This is exactly what we wanted. And so, in fact, we can, uh, we can generalize this claim. Let p be a prime number. And we have a commutative ring R with two elements, a and b. Then, if this prime number p inside the ring R divides a minus b, then, in fact, p to the k plus 1 divides a to the power p to the power k minus b to the power p to the power k. 
for all natural numbers k. And the claim that we just proved before, the case where k is equal to 1. At some point in our formalization of width vectors, we needed to use this lemma. It's somehow the, the key ingredient, maybe, in, in the basic setup that you need to make. So we formalized this lemma and made a pull request to the MATLAB repository, uh, the Lean Mathematical Library, where we wanted to, uh, to add our theory of width vectors. And so um, this is uh, some basic lemma, and uh, I made the pull request, and then the following happened. The pull request was rejected by our continuous integration. Some uh, linter had looked at the at the pull request and rejected it because it wasn't up to the standards of MATLAB. And what was actually the problem? It said that there was an unused argument. So what did we need to do? Here's the same lemma. And in fact, uh, we never used in, in the proof of the general lemma that P is a prime number. So really, in the end, we proved a, a lemma for all natural numbers p. And this is somewhat surprising. I never realized that this lemma was true in that generality. And I asked several mathematicians and they also didn't know this. So I, I think that's just some funny little benefit of formalization where these sort of things happen. And uh, yeah, of course, this is not a, a very big deal, but it's, it's a, it was a very funny experience, I thought. So now that, now that we have this lemma, let's continue because in the end we are interested in this addition with carry. So we have these two fundamental observations that we made. And um, now we can use those because we can now build a function from fp cross fp, where we want to do this addition with carry, to z modulo p squared z. And the way we do this is um, by sending x1, x0 to p times x1 plus x0 to the p. And now you should remember that the notation is, uh, is abused a little bit, but you shouldn't carry out this, computa this computation inside z modulo pz, because then you would just get uh, an end result in z modulo pz. But we really mean using these unique elements in z modulo p squared that we described before. And if you stare at this a little bit, then you'll realize that this function is actually a bijection. And so we can use this function to transfer the ring structure from z modulo p squared z to fp cross fp. So let's do that and see what the result is. What does the addition look like? Well, suppose that we have three pairs in fp cross fp, x1, x0, y1, y0, and z1, z0, and um, they satisfy the equation that uh, if you add the first two, you get the last one. Now, using this uh, bijection along which we transferred the ring structure, that means that uh, p times x1 plus x0 to the power of p plus p times y1 plus y0 to the power of p is equal to p times z1 plus z0 to the power of p. And now we look at this e resulting equation modulo p, so then all the terms of the form p times something will cancel, and we're left with x0 to the power of p plus y0 to the power of p is z0 to the power of p, but now modulo p. And modulo p, um, taking something to the power p, doesn't do anything. This is Fermat's little theorem. So, in fact, we just get x0 plus y0 is z0. And this is, this is also what we wanted, because we just want to add the last two digits and not do anything special there. So this confirms that we're on the right track. And so we know that z0 is just equal to the sum of x0 plus y0. So then we can substitute that into uh, the original equation. And that will give us um, 
the following equation. So now we focus on the p times z1 term. It's equal to p times x1, which we got from over here, p times y1, which we got from over here. And then we need to add these two terms. So we get uh, x0 to the power p plus y0 to the power p. And then we need to subtract, subtract this um, z0 to the power p, this term. But we know that z0 is equal to x0 plus y0. So we can also write that as x0 plus y0 between parentheses and then to the power p. And what you notice is that now we have an expression for p times z1 that is some sort of polynomial in um, x1, y1, x0, and y0. And the first two terms on the right-hand side are obviously divisible by p. Uh, the, the final uh, terms on the right-hand side, th there it's not so clear. But um, in fact, this polynomial, capital X to the power p plus y to the power p minus x plus y to the power p, is a polynomial with integral coefficients whose coefficients are all divis um, multiples of p, so they're divisible by p. Um, and the reason is, again, that we can use uh, the binomium of Newton. So you can expand this uh, x plus y to the power of p, and you see that uh, the first and the last term in the, in the big sum cancel against what we have in front. And so then the remaining terms all have this binomial coefficient of p over i. And because p is prime, the coefficient is divisible by p. So the upshot is that we can, uh, we can write this polynomial as uh, p times some polynomial uh, s prime in, with variables x0 and y0. And now s prime is some polynomial with integer coefficients, and we can evaluate it on uh, the elements in, in any arbitrary ring. So what we now do is um, we add back the variables x1 and y1, because you, if you recall from here, we had p times x1 plus p times y1, and of course we want to cancel the, the factor p there as well, because we're interested in, in extracting z1, and this is an equation for p times z1. So in the end, we end up with this polynomial s1 with, with four variables, x1, x0, y1, and y0, and it's x1 plus y1 plus this polynomial s prime, which is not very explicit, but if you want for specific uh, prime numbers p, you can actually compute what it looks like very explicitly. And then in the end, we find that z1 is equal to this polynomial s1 evaluated on the elements of our of our ring, um, x1, x0, y1, and y0. And so this s prime, this is exactly the expression for the carry in our addition. Right, so this was addition, and similarly, we can also find some polynomial p1 that uh, gives the correct expression for the transferred uh, multiplication that we, if we transfer it from z modulo p squared z to fp cross fp. And so the multiplication will, will look like um, evaluating this polynomial p1 on the coefficients uh, or on the elements x1, x0, y1, and y0. And the last digit will just be the product of the last digits. So that's exactly as we expect. And now using this uh, more general uh, lemma that was rejected by the computer, uh, as I explained a while ago, we can not only find polynomials uh, P1, but we can actually find polynomials uh, Sn and Pn. And they will now also take a lot more variables. Um, and those uh, will help us put a ring structure on Fp to the n. So now we can 
generalize this not only to, to taking two digits, but to taking an arbitrary amount of digits. Um, and in fact, we can then glue this all together. Um, and when we have this arbitrary amount of uh, digits, that's where you actually get width vectors. And these polynomials are, as you can see um, in, the, in the final result, they no longer mentioned anything particular about FP. So these polynomials are, in some sense, universal, and they can be uh, used to turn uh, to to create an addition with carry for an arbitrary ring R. So that's where uh, width vectors enter the picture. So as before, we still have our prime number p, and for every commutative ring R, the ring of width vectors over R. is uh, usually denoted with a blackboard bold W. And this is just uh, the, as a set, it's the set of all sequences of elements of R. So, so R to the power, the natural numbers. In concise notation and so this is the underlying set and now we need to know what the addition and multiplication are and those are given by these universal polynomials so the nth coefficient will be given by evaluating Sn on the last n digits of X and the last n digits of Y um, and similarly for the product we use the polynomials Pn to compute the nth coefficient. Okay, of course, um, making these polynomials really explicit is something that you don't want to do by hand, um, but computers can do that. Uh, and the nice thing is that we can now try to prove things about it, uh, this structure. Um, and one of the most fundamental things is that we need to check that this addition and multiplication actually forms a ring structure, so that it's we need to, to check the ring axioms. So um, I'll get to that in a second. But um, th these, these polynomials Sn and Pn, we already saw in the case of S1 that it was not very constructive. It, it was, we somehow extracted this polynomial S1 uh, out of this uh, expression where everything was multiplied by P, and so you need to know that things are divisible by P. This is a very messy induction proof, uh, where you move between computations with polynomials over the integers, over the rational numbers, and also working modulo uh, p to the k for some k. And this moving back and forth between uh, polynomials over the rational numbers and polynomials modulo p is, is something that's quite painful um, in, in a theorem prover. So you especially don't want to do this that often. You want to seal off this proof and then you don't want to return to it anymore. So the key ingredient in the proof was this computer says no lemma. And in total, um, getting the existence of these polynomials was, well, some, somewhere in the ballpark of, of 150 lines of, of messy induction proof. Okay, so now we want to check the ring axioms and um, it would be really painful if we have to go all the way through this inductive procedure of obtaining these polynomials. Um, luckily, we don't really have to do this. We can uh, define the so-called ghost map. And it's not as scary as it sounds, although it does have some ghost-like properties. And this is what, uh, what we'll focus on in the remainder of the talk, mainly. But once we have this ghost map, 
Um, and some basic properties of the ghost map. It's actually only 10 extra lines of code to check the ring axioms. Uh, so check that the addition and multiplication defined in terms of these polynomials actually satisfy associativity, commutativity, the unit laws, etc. So how do we define this ghost map? Well, um, first we need to define the so-called wit polynomial. And this is a polynomial again in, uh, in variables x0 up to xn. And so you take uh, a coefficient p to the power i times the variable xi to the power uh, p to the n minus i. And then um, the ghost map is a, is a ring homomorphism. from uh, the width vectors over R to the, the ring R to the power natural numbers, so the ring of sequences of elements of R. And in, the, in this target, so the ring of sequences, you just have component-wise addition and multiplication. So there, the ring structure is completely straightforward and obvious, and we know exactly what's going on. And so the way you define the homomorphism is just that the nth coefficient in a sequence is the value of the nth width polynomial on the on the last n or n plus one digits of the element of the ring of width vectors and you may notice that here i'm cheating a little bit because we're using this ghost map to check to check the ring axioms. And I'm already claiming that it is a ring homomorphism. But we first just define it as a function and check that this function preserves the multiplication and addition that we defined. So it's somehow a, a ring homomorphism on a lawless ring. And then we use this, we bootstrap this to actually prove the ring structure uh, on the ring of width vectors is an actual lawful ring and then we can afterwards call the ghost map an actual ring homomorphism now there is one very important remark to be made about this ghost map and that is that it's usually not injective so if you apply it you typically lo lose information and nevertheless one of the ghost-like properties is that you can apply it and get away with it uh, quite often. So that's what we'll, we'll be seeing in a moment. So when what are situations where you would like to apply this ghost map? Well, um, width vectors come with a sort of basic API. Uh, if you want to use them, then there are several functions, operations that you'll encounter very often. So the first is functoriality. Uh, the, the construction is functorial. If you have any function f between r and s, then we can just create a function from width vectors over r to width vectors over s by uh, taking x and applying f to all the coefficients. And it turns out that if f is a ring homomorphism between two rings, then this other construction will also give you a ring homomorphism between the respective rings of width vectors. The uh, second piece of the API is the so-called Teichmüller map. And what this does is it takes an element of the ring and injects it into the ring of width vectors by just putting this element R as the final digit and all the other digits will be zero. And this is a multiplicative map. And it sends zero to zero. Um, then there is the so-called Verschiebung, which is uh, a, the German word for shift. And 
it's also it's really defined as a shift. So you have your element x of the ring of width vectors, and you just shift all the coefficients uh, by one. So you put a zero at the end, and all the other coefficients make place by shifting one to to the left. Um, this map is additive. And then there is the so-called Frobenius operator. Frobenius. And so on rings of characteristic P, you have the so-called Frobenius homomorphism that Takes, two ele uh, takes an element and raises it to the power of p, and this is a ring homomorphism. And you could um, map this via the functoriality construction, and that would give you a map on, uh, on the ring of width vectors, but it only works if the input ring has characteristic p. And somehow um, that's not good enough for our purposes, so we want we want a Frobenius for every ring R. Um, but then the definition all of a sudden becomes a lot more complicated. But it turns out that you can do this, and it's a ring homomorphism again. And finally, there is the so-called uh, multiplication by n map, which just, uh, so this is an additive group homomorphism. Um, it just multiplies elements of the ring of width vectors by some uh, integer n. And all these operations satisfy some identities um, and we, we want to check those identities and prove them in our formalization. So what kind of identities are we talking about? Well, uh, the first fundamental identity is that if you apply Frobenius after Verschiebung then this is multiplication by the prime number p that is implicit in the entire construction uh, that we chose at the start. So another example of, a, of an identity is the so-called projection formula, which is the Verschiebung of x times the Frobenius of an element y is equal to the Verschiebung of x times just the element y. Okay. Um, now, proving these identities, if you just take a, a direct approach, then you'll have to work with the really nasty uh, definition of the Frobenius operator, and you get all these gory induction proofs again uh, it becomes a, a complete mess. And so what happens in the informal literature is that uh, we use the ghost map to prove this. And we need to know how the ghost map interacts with, um, with the operators that occur uh, in these identities. So um, let's see. Well, the, if, we, if we take the nth ghost component of the Verschiebung, then we get p times the n minus one ghost component of x. If we take the nth ghost component of Frobenius, we get the n plus first ghost component of, uh, of x. And if we take the nth ghost component of p times x, we just get p times the nth ghost component of x. So somehow um, proving these, uh, proving the how the ghost components interact with uh, with these operators is not so hard, and you have to do it only once. But um, now you see that if you apply the ghost map to, for example, the identity at the top, then uh, the remainder of the proof is really easy because you can just use these simplification rules um, and, and you'll be done with the proof. So that's the strategy that's taken in the informal literature. Um, we just uh, apply the ghost map and then we're basically done. But now you, 
will recall that this ghost map is usually not injective. So something spooky is going on. And how exactly can we justify this? So Hasewinkel, who, who has written a, a massive treatise on width vectors, he writes, there are pitfalls in calculating with ghost components as is done here. Such a calculation gives a valid proof of an identity only if it is a universal calculation. And this is basically all he says about it. And you're supposed to infer on your own what is a universal calculation and how to perform them and how to avoid the pitfalls. And this is quite typical, I would say, of the literature surrounding width vectors. If you know what you're doing, everything's fine. If you don't know what you're doing, good luck. But we wanted to formalize this because this is a challenging construction and how do we, uh, how do we get such a piece of advanced mathematics into a formal theorem prover and how do we make it usable so that we can actually have the system check that we know what we are doing um, but still have these one-line proofs where we just say apply the ghost map and we're done. So we had to formalize some magic and I want to explain a little bit how, how we'll do that uh, by walking you through a little bit of the code that we wrote. Here we're looking at the code of the width vector project and so here we have um, the definition of the Frobenius ring homomorphism and as you can see this we're almost at the bottom of this file so above this we have a, a very long and nasty proof that shows that uh, well a lot of preliminaries for this Frobenius ring homomorphism and then we prove that the ghost components of the Frobenius applied to X are just the ghost components of X but shifted by one and um, the key thing to making these computations with ghost components work is that we prove that Frobenius is a so-called polynomial function and Verschiebung will be a polynomial function um, Multiplication by n or by p is a polynomial function. Uh, addition, multiplication, all of these are polynomial functions. So we, we have uh, this predicate is poly. And um, what it says is the following. So we have some commutative ring r. And we have some function from the width vectors to itself. Uh, we also have a version is poly2 for uh, binary functions, so that would go from the width vectors uh, cross the width vectors to the width vectors. And what it says is, um, so we, ha we have such a function for every ring R, and now there should exist a sequence of polynomials, of integral polynomials, such that for every ring R, applying this function f to the width vectors over R is the same as evaluating this sequence of polynomials. So, so the nth polynomial on the coefficients of x will give the nth coefficient of the resulting width vector. So basically, to summarize what this predicate is saying is there's a sequence of polynomials that completely describes the function that you're working with. And so this is satisfied by Frobenius, this is satisfied by Verschiebung, multiplication by p, etc. And now we can, uh, we wrote a little bit of uh, meta code, so a little program to help us with proving, and the result is as follows. So here we have the statement that if you do uh, apply Frobenius after Verschiebung, then this is the same as, as multiplication by p. So if we look at the beginning of our proof state, here over at the right, we see that we have this ring R. It's a commutative ring. We have some width vector, and our goal is to prove that Frobenius after Verschiebung is multiplication by p. Then we apply this tactic ghost calculations on, and we feed it the element x. And afterwards, our goal state is very, very similar. 
we still have this R, which is a commutative ring, and um, we have our element x. And now we need to apply uh, to prove that for every n, if we apply the nth ghost component to Frobenius after Vashibo, it's the same as the nth ghost component of multiplication by p applied to x. But it looks deceptively similar, but it's actually not. You'll see that this r.inst is different from what it was before. Before it was inst2. And this is the only hint that something changed, that we did something, something spooky, because the ring r is not the same ring anymore. It's a completely different ring. We're just proving this now for all rings. And the fact that we do it for all rings, this is, this is the part that makes it a universal calculation. And because we prove it for all rings, then it actually uh, turns out you can use, uh, we can only do this for all rings um, because it's a polynomial function. We, we use that it's a polynomial function. And um, yeah, then, we can make it work so that we can apply this apparently non-injective map and still have a valid proof. And as you can see afterwards, just some, some easy simplification, we, we wrote a, a little um, sim set that we call with this uh, tactic ghost sim. It just finishes the proof immediately. And similarly, if we go to this projection formula, uh, it looks very similar. So here's the statement. Uh, at, at, the, at the bottom of this file, uh, if you apply Verschiebung to the product of x and Frobenius applied to y, it's the same as Verschiebung of x times y. And we just call uh, ghost calc. And after that, we only need to, uh, to compute where on ghost components. So we've applied this non-injective map. And the rest of the proof is one line, just as in the informal literature. And behind the scenes, this metacode is inferring that all the ingredients in the statement are polynomial functions, and it's using the machinery of polynomial functions to infer that it's a valid move to apply the ghost map, even though it's non-injective.